Everybody stand up. Write this now before I continue. Lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to say. Friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find their way. Few there are who seem to care. And few there are who pray. Melt my heart and fill my life. To win some soul today. Lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what you say. Friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find the way. Lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what you say everybody who oh, teach me Lord. friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find their way from the first line seem to care and feel there are who pray everybody feel there are who seem to care and feel there are who pray again feel there are who seem to care and feel there are who pray melt my heart and fill my life to win some soul today once again melt my heart Feel my life. Feel there are who seem to care, and feel there are who pray. Now melt my heart, melt my heart, and feel my life to some soul today. Feel there are. Feel there are Melt my heart <clears throat> From the beginning everybody Lead me to some soul today Teach me, Lord, just what you say. Friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find a way. Feel, feel there are who seem to care and feel there are who pray. Melt my heart and fill my life to win some soul today. Again, lead me to some soul
again. To say, friends of mine, I must listen and cannot find a way. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Lead me to some soul today. Teach me, Lord, just what to say. Friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find their way. I feel there are who seem to care. Feel there are who pray. Melt my heart, melt my heart, melt my heart, melt my heart, and fill my life to win some souls today. In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the privilege you've given us to come before you today again. Thank you for the work of the kingdom. The most important thing anyone can be involved with. I pray, Lord, that you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand, that we may know the value of your work and commit our very lives to the work you have given us to do. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Luke 10, verse 42. But one thing is needful. Here the Lord Jesus Christ was commenting on the choice of Mary. And as he looked at the choice of Mary, and Martha had been complaining. Because you know, life is a kind of mixture between the natural and the supernatural. Life is between the physical and the spiritual. Life is between getting involved with the eternal and the temporal. And Martha had been very much concerned about the natural, the physical, the temporal. But Mary, at such at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, concerned about the spiritual, about the supernatural, about the eternal. And there is always a conflict, a struggle, and a battle between the natural and the supernatural, between the physical and the spiritual, between the temporal and the eternal. It is the battle that goes on every time. The natural thing is pulling you this way, asking you to come. You need to do this. You need to get this done. You need to accomplish this. Your profession, bread and butter, your family, and the demand on your time. And it's like you feel like you believe this physical thing, this natural thing, ought to be done, must be done. But the spiritual side too, eternity, your own eternity, 
and eternity of multitudes of people that could be shaped, redirected by your effort. And so, as a physical, we always struggle with the spiritual as the natural will always be in conflict and battle with the supernatural master came and said master don't you care that mary has let me serving alone we must do the physical thing we must get involved in the natural thing we cannot all be so heavenly minded and so spiritual and so supernatural and be very conscious of eternal things here is what needs to be done. Don't you care that Mary has let me alone? And then Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are cumbered about, occupied with, bothered, burdened with physical things. But one thing is necessary. One thing is needful. One thing is important. When time is over, when the world has folded up, when heavens and earth, when they go on fire, when the elements thereof are melt with fervent heat, when all that we see today, when everything has passed away, matter, one thing will be important. Focus on that thing. Because you see, all the time we spent here, 70 years, 80 years, 100 years, what is that to a thousand years, to a million years, to a billion years? It becomes a negligible fraction. And when you get into eternity, the only thing that will be important, indispensable, the only thing that you will look back from eternity and look at time, will be that I spent my time on the spiritual, on the supernatural, on things of eternal value. So Jesus said, Martha, one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part. You have a choice to make. A choice between the physical and the spiritual. A choice between the natural and the supernatural. A choice between what is temporal and what is eternal. You have the choice to make. Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. That was a vision that John Wesley had more than 200 years ago. He caught the fire. And then he gathered his ministers together. Here is what he told them. He said, you have nothing to do but to save souls. Nothing else. Nothing to do but to save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in this work. It is not your business to preach so many times in so many fellowships. But to save as many souls as you can. To bring as many sinners as you possibly can to repentance. And with all your power to build them up in that holiness without which they cannot see the Lord. He said there is one thing to do. That's what we are talking about. The one thing needful. Saving souls. The one thing needful saving souls and when jesus came into this world that's what he concentrated on in luke chapter 19 luke chapter 19 verse 10 for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost when your life does not have purpose, goal, focus, you are lost. Many, many people come into this world and their lives do not have a purpose, a goal, an aim, a focus. But Jesus knew why he came. That's why whenever other things attracted or distracted him, he would overlook them 
and he will focus on the reason why he came. He said, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the thing that informed his action. When in John chapter 6, they wanted to come and make him king. In John chapter 6 verse 15, when Jesus therefore perceived that they will come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again unto the mountain himself alone. Making him a king. That would have been something that many people will be looking for today. Be the king of a nation. Be the prime minister in a nation. Be a political figure in a state. And have a high position. But remember, the physical, the natural, the temporal will always be in conflict with the spiritual, the supernatural, the eternal. And Jesus will not allow those material things, physical things, natural things, to derail him and to shift his focus away from the one thing needful, which is saving souls. So when they wanted to come and make him a king, he dodged. He escaped. He ran away from it because he knew the one thing necessary. In John chapter 9, John chapter 9, reading there in verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. It's just a matter of time. The night cometh. And sometimes when you wake up in the morning, and you feel and you think and you plan that you have a whole day in front of you and the seconds and the minutes go just like that before you know what's happening the night comes and that's the parable you have every day illustrating to you how your life is now you are young now you are strong now you're energetic now you're intelligent now you can run now you can talk. Now you can work. But the night cometh when no man can work. And the Lord knew the focus of his life and the reason why he came. And so he concentrated on that one thing needful. I challenge you and ask you, how are you spending your time? What's the focus of your life? What do you think about what do you meditate about? What do you talk about? What do you plan about? What are the things that occupy your thoughts and your mind all through the day? As you look at every day and you spend every day, what are the things that are major in your life? One thing is needful. I pray you will choose that needful, necessary thing. The message I'm bringing to you, I've told you already, is the one thing needful, saving souls. Three points. Number one, passion for souls. Passion. Passion for souls. The believer who is on fire for God has passion for souls. The believer who has not caught the spirit of the age, the spirit of lukewarmness. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The believer who has not been injected with the injection of the world, running after the world, seeking the world, amassing the world, acquiring the world, and what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? But the believer who has not been injected with the injection of the world, who has got the fire of the Lord upon his life and the vision of glory and a vision of heaven upon his soul, and he can see beyond 
today. He can see beyond this year. He can see beyond this short life. And he sees into eternity. The believer who allows the fire of the Holy Ghost and the very personal personality of Christ to infiltrate him. That believer will be on fire. He'll have passion for souls. Nothing else will hold his interest. Passion for evangelism will be the mark of his life. The intensity of the Spirit's fire within him will stir him up to preach to souls and prevail on those souls to repent and to come to Christ. Such flaming zeal for souls cannot be easily dampened by difficult or discouraging circumstances. He'll climb every mountain. He'll descend every valley. He'll travel any distance. He'll reach anyone. He'll open his mouth and tell the people how they can come to Christ, how they can have life eternal. It's on fire for God. Where there is such a passion, there'll be love for souls. And saving souls will be the one thing needful in his life in john chapter 4 john chapter 4 from verse 6 through to verse 10 now jacob's well was there jesus therefore being wearied with his journey sat thus on the well and it was the sixth hour there cometh a woman of samaria to draw water Jesus says unto her, Give me to drink. Now Jesus was weary. Because he says in verse 8, For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat, to buy food. Hungry, tired, weary in the physical. And here comes a woman, a candidate of heaven. Here comes a woman, a sin lady woman here comes a woman although jesus was physically tired but the reason jesus came is because of this woman of the world for god sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved he came to save and here comes a woman representing the world a worldly minded woman and jesus christ forgot his tiredness and he forgot his physical need. And he saw his soul to be saved and to be won unto life eternal. But he must start a conversation. He must draw the woman out of where she was into where she ought to be. He must draw the attention of the woman, the thoughts of the woman, the thinking of the woman, the mind of the woman, the focus of the woman. Away from her concentration and make her now think about not just earthly fleshly physical enjoyment but happiness forever and ever and so he asked that the woman will give him water to drink in verse 9 then says the woman of samaria unto him how is it that thou being a jew Ask us, drink of me, which I am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. When you have passion for souls, tribalism will not be in your blood. Nationalism, sectionalism will not be in your blood. You don't consider things of this earth. Every opportunity, you forget the tradition of the land. You forget the tribal situation of the land. The Jews don't talk to Samaritans. And the Samaritans don't talk to the Jews. You forget about that. That is beneath my dignity. I cannot lower myself and talk to this individual. You forget about that. The woman is so dirty and the woman is so immoral. Anybody see me talking to this woman will be questioning my character and where I am coming from and what my purpose is. You forget about your personal dignity and what people will say and what people will not say. You are driven. You are motivated. You are fired. You are ignited by the fire of passion for souls and jesus christ he was ignited and he was fired like that he began that conversation give me water to drink because 
he didn't want that soul to be lost and then we're told in verse 10 and jesus answered and said unto her if thou knewest the gift of god and who it is that says unto thee give me to drink that wouldest have asked of him and he would have given thee living water well you know the story but start your one now in the meantime his disciples prayed him pleaded with him begged him saying master eat master eat this for your health you need to be strong master eat don't be all spiritual now master eat don't think too much of eternity now temporal things are important to you master eat all these spiritual spiritual things must not be too much don't be fanatical master eat uh, you know master it's good to be spiritual but it's good to balance up everything master each and you know there are people that they don't understand being on fire being passionate they don't understand being ignited and just on fire for the lord and wanting souls to be saved they don't understand and they'll be pleading they'll be pleading the physical is important to you the natural is important to you the temporal is important to you master each it's good to eat but don't forget the goal of living don't forget the purpose of living don't forget the focus of life and then in verse 32 but he said unto them i have meat to eat i have meat to eat that she know not all peter are you offended john james are you offended you took so much labor to prepare to go and buy the food all the labor all the exerting of energy the spending of money and now you brought the thing and the man said he was hungry and he was sad and was weary before we went now we come and he has another food to eat that we know not of are you angry you know it's very easy for the spirit of Martha to come upon disciples and to make jesus christ get diverted from the one thing needful so he said there's another thing i'm living for there's another thing that attracts my attention there's another thing that pins me down and kicks me and stirs me up that's what i'm living for i have food to eat that you know not of therefore said the disciples one to another as any man brought him out to eat those people could never understand they could never understand they could never understand they could never understand that you can be hungry and go on walking walking for god they don't understand that you can be tired and keep on walking for god they don't understand you can have a physical need a natural need and then your spiritual passion and your spiritual fire can so override and overwhelm all the physical needs and keep on witnessing saving souls and never think about your physical need they thought somebody must have come to meet that physical need and then jesus says unto them my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work hunger or no hunger tiredness or no tiredness weariness or no weariness difficult discouraging circumstances or not my passion the central thing in my life my meat my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work keep on doing it until i finish that's passion for souls in acts of the apostles chapter 8 acts chapter 8 verses 4 and 5 therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word please understand when you read that ordinarily you don't think about it persecution arose in jerusalem and the people were scattered abroad thrown out of their houses they couldn't carry their buildings for them persecution separated them from every physical possession they had 
And instead of hanging their heads in defeat and shame and sorrow and regret. Oh, they forgot about that. That's just physical thing. That's just house. That's just material thing. That thing doesn't matter. Don't allow the physical, the natural, the temporal to cloud your vision. But the things that are spiritual, supernatural, and eternal. So they forgot about it. They've taken our houses. Who cares? We've lost every physical, material thing. Who cares? And they've thrown us away from Jerusalem, from the capital city. And that's the place some of us have never traveled out before. We never left the conveniences of our houses before. They've taken everything away from us. Who cares? What does that matter? They can take property. They can take material things. Can they take the gospel of salvation and the gospel of peace? Can they take the passion, the fire we have in our souls to lead people to the Lord? They didn't care for the physical inconveniences and for the consequences of the persecution. They were scattered all abroad and they went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ unto them. Please think about it. Uh, if this Christ is so mighty and powerful, why did persecution come and Jesus did not protect us? How is it that these persecutors are more powerful than our Savior, than our Lord? And he allowed us to lose all our land, all our houses, everything, even our jobs, all that we're doing, even the privilege in the church. Because Philip was one of those seven people that they were chosen to take care of the business of distributing food in the church. My position, everything I've lost. How about that now? When you have passion for souls, the temporal loss does not count or matter with you. They went everywhere preaching the word and then Philip went to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ unto them. That's passion. That's passion. That you don't care what you have lost. You don't care what you still have remaining. You don't care what persecution you are facing you don't care what difficulties you have you don't care what physical desires natural desires you have whether they are met or they are not met whether you are happy whether you're unhappy all that matters to you is a privilege of reaching out to the souls that are perishing out there in romans chapter 1 romans chapter 1 verse 14 i am debtor both to the greeks and to the barbarians both to the wise and to the unwise so as much as in me is i am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at room also and you must know the history of this man because the very moment he got converted in damascus he began to suffer persecution the very first week and they wanted to kill him and they had to lure him in a basket over the wall that persecution ah the morning determines the day if at the beginning of my christian life persecution came and they're looking for my life and they want to kill me and they're luring me in a basket what am i going to do if it starts like that how will it end paul thank you for giving us the example you don't care about what life will bring or what outcome will be for life all that matters when you have passion for souls go do it in fact um, you know, in the life of Paul the Apostle, there were some people that thought he didn't have uh, enough vision, enough revelation. And so they came with the vision, to give the vision unto him. And as they were somewhere, uh, Agabus, he thought he was, you know, doing Paul a favor. And he tied himself and bound himself with his girdle and said, So shall they do to the man when he gets to Jerusalem. Whoever has this girdle, and that girdle belongs to Paul the Apostle, is a belt. And then all the people there, I'm telling you, when you don't have passion for souls, all these physical hindrances will be making you to get disturbed and you'll be crying. And they were crying. And then Paul the Apostle said, What's the matter with you people? You are not the one that will die. I am the one that will die. And I'm going to jerusalem and it doesn't matter what matters is the salvation of souls what matters is that i get committed to the work the lord has given me to do and to finish that work what me ye to weep and to break my heart 
because of the prophecy and because of revelation because somebody had a dream because somebody had a vision that this man when he gets to jerusalem they're going to kill him everybody will die one day if jesus tarries i know you die on the road or you die in the sky in the airplane or you die on the sea or you die just sleeping just sleep just go but everybody will go through somewhere everybody will die one day everybody will die and so paul the apostle said what's the matter with you people the thing that matters is not when you die and how you die the thing that matters is that the work the lord has given you to do have fire have passion and be excited about it and while life remains get it done that's why he said i'm a debtor to the barbarians and to the greeks for he said in verse 16 for i am not ashamed of the gospel of christ for it is the power of god unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the jew first and then to the greek that's the passion in first corinthians chapter 9 first corinthians chapter 9 here we're reading from verse 16 chapter 9 verse 16 for though i preach the gospel i have nothing to glory of for necessity is laid upon me yea woe is me if i preach not the gospel for if i do the sin willingly I have a reward but if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me what's my reward then verily that when i preach the gospel i may make the gospel of christ without charge that i abuse not my power in the gospel for do i be free from all men yet have i made myself servant unto all that i might gain the more in verse 22 it says to the weak became i as weak that i might gain the weak i have made all things to all men that i might by all means by all means by all means save some passion for souls that's the passion we ought to have when the lord lays that passion the burden on us you want to read point number one passion for souls point number two the priority of his servants the priority of his servants when you become a child of god you also become a servant of the lord and if there is anything you own him you accept him as lord and savior and you cannot accept jesus as savior without accepting him lord you can carry out this assignment and go through the new testament you see concordance every time savior lord lord savior those two words every time those two words are used concerning the lord jesus christ the lord comes first is lord and savior he is lord and savior he is lord and savior if you accept him as savior automatically he becomes your lord and the predominant thing and the essential thing and the obvious thing and the exalted thing in your life is that every time you are his servant and he is lord the priority of his servants for every servant of the master who has the might of christ evangelism is a priority of life if you firmly believed that a sinner's relationship with christ determines his eternal destiny you would esteem one soul gained for heaven was a life of suffering if you really and truly believed that when a soul is saved when a person a sinner hears the gospel and he accepts that gospel and is turned around and turned to the lord if you firmly believed that a sinner's relationship is very important and it determines his eternal destiny you would esteem one soul gained for heaven was a life of suffering as lay consideration as lay consequences would not hinder your preaching to sinners nor seal up your lips before the backsliders if you truly believed when you meet a backslider that our business discussion 
is not the important thing. Our exchange of money is not the important thing. And there are many people that do business with backsliders. Yes, I know he has left Christ. Yes, I know he has left the church. Yes, I know he has left this. Yes, I know he has left that. But that's his business. I'll still do my business. If you truly believe that relationship with Christ here on earth was the most important thing and that that relationship here on earth determines that individual's destiny in heaven or in hell every time you spend you'll say whether the business goes through or not whether the contract goes through or not whether we still continue to work together or not my friend here is one important thing where will you spend eternity with any friend with any neighbor with any community man community woman or with your child whatever is going on whatever is not going on the challenge you'll place before that individual if you truly believe and firmly believed that the decision for christ now will determine where that individual will spend eternity as lay considerations as lay consequences will not bother you at all ah if i talk about christ if i talk about salvation if i talk about righteousness if i talk about preparing for the coming of the lord he might cut me off and the business may not go through and i may not be able to get the money i want to get if you believe that the most important thing is the salvation of the soul of this individual or the recovery the restoration of that backslider all those earthly natural physical material monetary considerations will not matter with you you will strive to look upon eternity alone and you will strive to look on immortal souls around you soon to be everlastingly happy or everlastingly miserable you will go forth to all sinners around you and you will preach christ in season and out of season my question to you today is what's your priority in life what are you addicted to what are you sold on what are you committed to what is the very passion and the priority of your life what is the thing that drives you and the thing that stirs you up what's the thing that interests you what are you actually looking for here in the world is it the salvation of souls in john chapter 2 the priority of his servants in john chapter 2 verse 5 his mother says unto the servants whatsoever he says unto you do it that's the priority of the servant the master is telling you something the lord is telling you something the savior is telling you something he's telling you have a focus in life salvation of souls is the most important thing in life whatsoever he says unto you do it in john chapter 4 john chapter 4 verse 35 say ye not there are yet four months and then cometh the harvest behold i say unto you lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest and every farmer knows that there is a time of harvest and once the time passes and the fruits arrive and then they override then if you don't go at that time eventually the harvest will be wasted the wind will blow the rain will come the animals will come every other thing around will come and destroy the harvest because you did not go to that harvest field in time and so jesus said disciples do you remember the very first sentence i gave you when you were converted when i brought you to myself follow me and i will make you fishers of men i didn't call you to just follow me to just sit down there to just enjoy to just eat bread multiplied for five thousand for four thousand i told you the goal i told you the aim i told you where we're going before we began and i told you follow me and i will make you 
fishers of men. If there is anything that ought to be the priority of your life, it's not make me what you intended. Make me what you wanted. Make me what was in your original plan, your original goal. To make me a fisher of men. Not position, not title, but evangelism. Not sitting down on a title, on a position. All those things, they don't matter. Whatever the title. The thing that matters to the Lord is the work to be done. In Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Verse 15 and verse 16. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace and called me by his grace and called me by his grace the priority of life uh, there are many calls you could have if god called you here and he says souls are perishing there go and reach them go and talk to them go and save them and then you had a call from the top the highest political seat in the country. Those who don't have any vision would rather answer the call to the political office rather than the call to go and save souls that are lost. Paul the Apostle said when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb to call me by his grace and to reveal his son in me that I might preach among the heathen immediately. Nobody pleaded with him, begged him, encouraged him, pushed him, enticed him with remunerations. If you accept, this will be given. This will be the condition of service. In fact, the condition of service that the Lord told uh, Paul, the very day he called him, said Ananas go to him go and lay hands on him tell him the things he must suffer for my sake that was the condition of service if the Lord used me today to call you yes you are winning souls yes you are doing something but to preach him fully all your life everything so send I you as my father sent me so send I you to live your life's ambition and to die to their desire and to go to where you are not loved you are not appreciated and to go and preach the gospel that the master is sending me to tell you give your whole life to this and i tell you before you say yes or no here is the condition of service every city where you go you're going to experience persecution the jews are going to be after you a few times they might stone you a few times they'll lay the stick on your back a few times you'll be shipwrecked a few times things are going to be so difficult a few times the people you're going to an area called assyria even the believers there they're going to forsake you a few times you are going to despair of life that's the condition of service but the lord is calling you what's your answer Yes, I accept, or no, I refuse. The majority of people with no passion, with no priority, they'll say, I'm sorry. That kind of condition of service doesn't encourage anybody. Souls are dying. Souls are dying. God needs somebody that will not care for what may happen or what may not happen. Sometimes when somebody is called and he has to go and do something for god in a particular place he gets to that place and as he looks at the physical conditions there he says is this what i'm coming for the passion for soul is not there and the desire to make the work of the lord a priority is not there what are the conditions of service what are we going to get if the conditions of service are not appropriate who thinks i'm going to give myself and go for such a thing but he said i conferred not with flesh and blood immediately i conferred not with flesh and blood in luke chapter 9 from verse 59 and he said unto another 
follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me, allow me, permit me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Let the dead bury their dead. Leave that alone. Isn't that a difficult uh, thing for people today? When our relatives die, will they not at least give us enough time to go and do a decent burial? This evangelism is so important. They are telling us the person who has died has died. Let's care for the people that are still alive. So it means now we shouldn't worry about you know, our father, our mother, our relatives, our loved ones when they die. And some may say, well, if I leave the work of God now, I think nobody will blame me. Because the conditions are becoming tougher. They won't allow you to even go and bury your relatives now. That's your priority. Depends on what you really want to do in life. And what you want your life to count for is said unto him. Let the dead bury their dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. But let me go first, bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. Master, I have a wife at home. Marriage is so important. And the two shall be one. How, you are calling me now. How can I just say yes here and take a decision here? And I have not told my wife. Suppose my wife will not agree. How about my loved ones? In our family, we are united. In our family, any decision anybody wants to take, we consult ourselves. Not this one. Here is the Lord of Lords. Here is the King of Kings. Here is the one that saying, As my Father has sent me, even so have I sent them also into the world. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And you know that. Many, many things that may make us to look back. We read the Bible. God himself can develop situations to test you to test me to test us at least we know that he tested abraham and he said bring your son and go and sacrifice him to me ah if it reaches that point i should know when to say no he can test you at least we know he used elijah to test elisha the lord has sent me to bethel to gilgal to jericho and to Jordan, you stay here. He can use me to test you. Stay here. You have done enough. Why are you so excited? Wanting to serve, wanting to walk. You are doing this, you are doing this, you want to do this again. That's too much for you. He can use me to test you. It's you that will say, No, Pastor, my life, everything, my very blood in my veins. Everything is committed to evangelization of nations, whatever. But brother, see this condition and see this need and see. The Lord can make me to pity your condition and say in this condition, how can you do this? You are the one that will reply, no, I've laid my hands on the plow and I will not turn back. And apart from using my verbal utterances to test you, I can use my actions to test you. I may not know it's using my actions to test you. Uh, some of my actions might bring some natural discouragement to you. And you say, I wanted to serve God. I wanted to, you know, spend and be spent for the work of the kingdom. But hey, look at the way, you know, this uh, man is doing now. And that action can test you. And I just have a nice time, just go my way. And I'm happy in the Lord. I just do what I want to do. And the action may bother you and test you and you might be saying god if it is like this i will not and i just go and do what i'm doing and yet you know those actions are just testing you and i just surrender myself to the lord oh lord use me either to preach to them or to encourage them or to stir them up or to test them use my actions because he uses elijah he uses moses he uses paul the apostle he uses circumstances he uses everything it's you that will decide that I know my calling and I know what the Lord wants me to do and the storm and the wind and the rain 
and the flood and whatever it is may come. I am decided and I'm dedicated to the work of the Lord. And in Jesus' name, I will do it. I said we'll do it in Jesus' name. The test. But you see, the priority of your life will be that here is what I'm going to do. Number one is a passion for souls. Number two is a priority of his servants. Number three, the power for service. Power for service. A Christian who is truly full of the Holy Ghost will live in devotion to Christian witness. Leading sinners to the Savior will be a soul-consuming passion. The Great Commission will be placed before him continually, constantly, consistently. By the Holy Spirit, his heartbeat will be daily commitment to winning souls to Christ. This is the infallible proof that the Christian is filled and full of the Holy Ghost. And if you are willing to serve and willing to save souls, God will fill you with his spirit. Acts chapter 1. Acts 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Wait there for a moment. The power of the Holy Ghost. It's not just to shake. It's not to just speak with tongues. The power of the Holy Ghost coming upon a saved, sanctified believer. is to make him a witness. A soul winner. A preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He shall receive power. It is a kind of power that makes you to always be on fire. Always having passion. And you don't easily get discouraged. Every little wind that blows, discouragement. Every little problem, discouragement. Every little insult, discouragement. Every little criticism, discouragement. Every little stumbling block, discouragement. Every little obstacle, discouragement. Every little frown, discouragement. Every little insult and assault from the world around you, discouragement. Every little sin, every little financial need, discouragement. Every little thing that happens in your business, discouragement. This is a kind of power that makes you to rise above all those discouraging things. And you shall receive power. You know this. Before this disciples and apostles before they had this power of the holy ghost they were trying to avoid trouble avoid conflict uh -uh, not jesus they just try to stone you the other place the other time are we going there again peter you must be one of them no i never knew him he was afraid to die you check up after acts of the apostles chapter 2 when the holy ghost came and the power came, and the fire came, and the passion came, and the priority was established. And the Holy Ghost took over his life. All those little, little things that used to distract his attention, that used to make him deny. Even greater things came. But he was still bent on preaching the word of God. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. And it doesn't matter whether it is Jerusalem or Samaria or Judea or uttermost part of the earth. Where the amenities are not available. It doesn't matter whether the conveniences are there or not. When the power comes, the power will be the thing stirring you up and moving you, guiding you on, driving you on. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, in verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto him, Ye rulers of the people, and elders of Israel, If we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, does this man stand here before you whole? This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, 
For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Power for service. He had received the Holy Ghost. Their threatenings and whatever it is did not make them to back down or back out. Eventually, in verse 21, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old, on whom this miracle of healing was showed. I mean, let go. They went to their own company and they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. And said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage? And the people imagined vain things. The kings of the earth stood up. And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For the truth against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Behold their threatenings. How are they going to pray now? Behold their threatenings. Protect us. Don't let their threatenings uh, be carried out. Don't let us suffer. Those people, they know how to persecute. They can beat somebody to death. Oh Lord, protect us. Was that their prayer? Listen to their prayer. Listen to their prayer. As they prayed. Behold, Lord, their threatenings. And grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. That's what got him into trouble. We preach, we got into trouble. Give us more messages and give us more fervency and give us more boldness to preach the word. Let the trouble come, let's preach more. Let the trouble come, let's preach more. Let the trouble come, let's preach more. Give us boldness that we may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal. That's what got them into trouble. Somebody was healed and then they got into trouble. Give us more power. That more sick people will be healed. Then more problems will come. And more people will be healed. And more problems will come. And that signs and wonders may be done. By the name of the holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed. The place was shaking. Where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they did what? I said they did what? I said they did what? They spoke the word with boldness. That's the reason for the Holy Ghost coming upon us. It's not for, you know, just speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues, and talking about casting out devils. That's good, but, you know, go beyond that. Preach the word. What the Lord is calling us to is that there will be the passion for souls. There will be the priority of his servants. There will be the power for service. The Lord is calling us. Let me remind you once again. The one thing needful, saving souls. Let's end with the words of John Wesley again. You have nothing to do but to save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in this work. It is not your business to preach so many times in so many fellowships, but to save as many souls as you can and to bring as many sinners as you possibly can to repentance and with all the power within you to build them up in that holiness without which they cannot see the Lord. I pray God will set you on fire. And your prayer will be, lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to say. Friends of mine, neighbors of mine are lost in sin and cannot find their way. Few there are who seem to care. And few there are who pray. Melt my heart. Stand up now. Melt my heart. Melt my heart. Melt my heart. And fill my life to win some souls every day. Melt my heart, melt my heart and fill my life to win some souls today. Win some souls every day. Let the Lord give you passion and body for souls. Souls are perishing, souls are dying. Rescue them. 
preach the word of life to them. Forget all these petty, petty considerations and consequences. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. 